Hey there. So in this video, we're going to walk through the authentication and authorization uh, portion of ICE, just to understand how to configure, uh, you know, authentication policies and authorization policies, at least from the get-go, to permit an authentication. So to start off, we're going to go to our policy and authentication. Now to understand how this works, what happens is, is everything is processed as we have here policy type rule based is being processed as like an access control list where first match goes. Now there's a way to make it match multiple but I'm not really certain what value that adds. So um, what we have here though is that for instance we have some pre-built rules like map.1x and the default rule. So if we look here, uh, map has a compound condition called wireless map and wired map or wireless map. And then we're saying the allowed protocols are default network access. And we're saying this is the default rule, rule set in this section to use internal endpoints as the uh, location for that endpoint information. So this is where we would load all of our MAC addresses that we'd want to have processed in a certain policy um, in the internal endpoint store. The next rule we have here is .1x. So with .1x, what we have is the ability, uh, we have a wired .1x comp compound condition as well as wireless .1x, and our allowed protocols are default network access, which we'll go through in a minute. And the default rule is to uh, use all user ID stores. And what this is is a compound like ID store or identity source sequence that says, I'm going to use internal users, I'm going to use any Active Directory users, any other stores that I have configured. And we have a default rule. If we don't match any of these, then the allowed protocols are default network access and all user ID stores. Uh, depending on the environment, the default rule can be left as it is because you know most of our authorization matches should be, or actual network access authorization is on the next portion. However, in some environments, some customers do like to have this disabled. To disable a rule, um, you know, one of the things we could do is you can usually select and disable. It looks like this rule may actually be permanently on. So um, you could create a rule above that that just says if and then make it radius authentication, then, um, you know, deny access. But anyway, to make a change on any of these rules, you just double click. And from here we can, for instance, uh, click plus here and add different policy information. Um, but for right now, um, to understand what default network access is, if we go to policy and then policy elements here and we go to results, we can go to authentication and allowed protocols. Now here you can see default network access. When I click on default network access, this will tell me what that is going to allow as far as uh, authentication types. So. Um, by default, we're saying we're going to process host lookups um, for uh, any Mac off bypass on devices, which is great. That's what we want. We're also allowing PAP ASCII. So depending on the scenario, this may or may not be something you want to enable, um, depending on the type of authentication. Allow EPMD5. I typically turn that off unless they have a device that's using MD5. I also typically turn off EPGTC. Um, and you know, depending on the scenario, maybe even EPMS chap depending on uh, you know if the customer has certificates implemented. But for now we're going to leave uh, PEEP enabled. Um, we're going to turn off EAP fast because we're not using EAP fast. We are going to allow EAP TLS. Um, and then you know we can also, or EAP TTLS I mean, um, actually we could disable that as well. Um, really we just want to allow uh, PEEP. We want to allow EAP TLS. And Let's see if there's anything else we want to allow on here. No, that sounds good. Because really, truly, in most scenarios, you're either going to be doing peep, peep, MS, chap, peep, peep, TLS, or eep, TLS as the native authentication. Um, we could also have a PAP ASCII if it was a web page, for instance, that was using Radius to authenticate a client. So let's click Save here. All right, so we just, we just locked this down a little bit to make sure that uh, that no one getting on the network is, you know, for instance, using uh, MS chap v1 is just the full method because it's not encrypted. We also don't want to allow MS chap v2 without an encryption method because it is also very vulnerable. 
uh, etc. We don't want to allow leap unless there's some strange reason you need leap, as leap is also very easy to decrypt and get you know credentials as a whole. So um, we'd be able to get username and password information, and uh, yeah, not very secure. So anyway, now we've locked down the authentication page. So, or at least the authentication portion. So um, at this point, what we're saying is we're gonna permit default network access and we're gonna use all ID stores. There could be a chance where maybe you don't wanna use internal users and you wanna use just a single identity source. So to change these, we actually go to administration and we go to external identity sources. Actually, we go to identity source sequences, not external identity sources. Now, here's where you can see what is in all user ID stores. So what we're saying is all Active Directory join points, all internal users, all guest users. Um, one thing we're missing is internal endpoints. You don't want this. Typically, it's only for MAB um, or for MAC address authentication. So I wouldn't move this into that group. Um, and then advanced search list settings. So if I wanted to, for instance, remove guest users, um, and just have internal users and AD join points. But if I'm not found in internal users, I want it to fail. Uh, I could say do not access other stores. Highly recommend leaving that alone as because uh, that, that kind of defeats the purpose of a s identity source sequence as it should be going through each of those until it either finds a match or denies authentication. So um, we have authentication policies. I typically leave those alone unless there's a reason to make them more granular, like locking down the types of authentications that are permitted through the ICE server. Um, but really all of our policy work is going to be done in the authorization tab. So by default, there are quite a few different um, authorization policies configured. I personally do not like using the pre-configured policies at all, A, because you have to go through and make sure you understand what each of the pieces are in here, as well as, uh, you know, there's also some things in here that are configured very specifically for certain platforms. So I will go through and, for instance, I'm going to delete all these ones in the middle here because really they serve no purpose for me at this point. There may be a reason to use them, and if any of you know of a reason that you would like to keep these in here when configuring ICE, please. Uh, comment. I would greatly appreciate it. But we're going to delete a lot of these. So basic authentication access. So we're saying if network access authentication passed, in other words, if the user has found an identity store, permit access. No thanks. We're also going to get rid of uh, this IP phone profile for right now. And this one as well. We will work on these later. And then wireless blacklist. This is actually a pretty cool one. We might have to modify the wireless access compound condition to make sure it matches an MR, but what this can do is if a device is marked as blacklisted, so if a device is registered and then later the user finds out that the device has been lost or stolen, they can click to blacklist it. The next time that user or that device is actually connected to the network, it'll redirect to a blacklist page. Um, this can be done in dashboard as well, where you just click and block the client and put a little splash uh, message. Um, same idea goes here. You can modify this blacklist or black hole wireless access page that uh, can state, you know, this device has been stolen. Please contact IT. Anyway, I'm going to click save real quick. Highly recommend that uh, when you're building out policies, this default policy rule here that we can see, um, leave it as deny access. I've seen so many occasions where someone made this permit access when they were doing a deployment and it, you know, it, it causes it to be very open, you know, where I can get on very easily for no reason at all other than uh, the policy stated to permit anything. So um, once again, these are also processed top down. So uh, we start at the beginning um, of the rule set and go down through until we find a match and then apply the permission at the end. You can see here, as I mentioned earlier, we could do multiple matched rules applied. I don't understand the value to that today. Um, there could be uh, could be one if you wanted to match on multiple like listings, and it overwrites different rule sets depending on the hierarchy, and it's confusing. So there's also this exceptions tab here. So if you needed to create a quick rule to permit access, and you didn't want to modify any of the standard rule sets, you could create a new rule that maybe permits a certain username. Uh, to access the network, like let's say you needed to 
have quick admin access to a bunch of services uh, in a bunch of different buildings. Um, this is a place to do it. Exceptions are typically not meant to be permanent. They're meant to be exceptions for a, you know, a small time period. All right, so if we wanted to create a rule that just permits network access, there was one in there. However, why not create it by hand here? So let's just call this permit access. And what we're going to do is uh, there's this little area right here. Uh, it says if any. Now, any means uh, right now that we're not saying it's a user, an internal user type or endpoint identity group. However, you could say, you know, like, Later in the later down the road, we'll do one for like guest access, where we say if it's a um, guest registered device, then um, proceed with the rest of the conditions. However, so right now we always want this to be any unless we're matching based on a type of group endpoint uh, uh, or endpoint group or uh, user group internal in ICE. Now conditions. Um, this is where we can actually start creating uh, conditions that match um, authentication. So to start, there are um, a number of different uh, attributes we can select here. Um, for instance, maybe we just want to do radius authentication. Oh, I can't see the rest of that. Um, radius auth, and then we could go um, NAS port type equals, and maybe we decide it is mm, you know, wireless IEEE 80211. So what we can just say here is that if it's uh, coming from a, an 80211 uh, device, um, then, you know, permit access. This is not a good rule. This is more or less that default rule they had on there. This just pertains to, let's just say this is called permit wireless access. So literally, if you wanted to make a rule that just permitted anyone connecting to wireless uh, that, uh, fell into that default policy and the user account was found in one of the user uh, user stores then just permit them on the network this would be the way to do it um, we're going to get more granular into more use cases into an actual use case actually in the next couple videos um, however uh, at this point i think that this kind of sums up the overall page and understanding how these policies work uh, i hope this was informative and i appreciate you checking this out